I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Mary Lou Singleton. She's a deep ecologist, radical midwife, and women's liberation activist. She practiced as a home birth midwife for over 15 years and currently provides primary health care as a family nurse practitioner in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mary Lou believes that birth is a sacred rite of passage and that preserving wild human birth is integral to the struggle for the preservation of all wild systems on Earth. So I guess I have two questions. The first question is, what is a what is radical midwifery? And the second question is, what is wild human birth? Ah. Um, so radical midwifery is um, non-professionalized midwifery. Radical midwifery is the um, the system of of women of our culture helping each other give birth in the way our species has done since its inception as a species. It's um, it's a movement to bring back the wisdom of women know how to give birth, women know how to help each other give birth. This isn't something that needs to be standardized, professionalized, automated. It's part of ourselves as, as a species. We know how to do this, and women have always helped each other do this. And then the second question is, what is wild human birth? Um, so I believe that an undisturbed, unmedicated, undisrupted birth is as wild as our modern species gets these days. And uh, it's um, it's a process of a woman just, you know, letting go of her thinking self and letting the wisdom of the body take over and let that wild process unfold and and let the new person emerge from her body into this wild world. So in a in a in a practical sense, I mean, what 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 does that mean? I mean, are you saying that women should not have anesthetics? Are you saying that they should um, not be in a hospital? Are you saying that they should, I don't know, not be lying on their backs? I don't I don't know physically what you're talking about. Okay, so I believe that in the you know in the vast majority of cases, human birth works very very well and medicalized technology is, is not necessary most of the time. Um, you know, obviously there are times when the process goes awry and, and it's, it's wonderful to have technology available. But for the majority of women, if they're healthy and they have a healthy pregnancy and they only have one head down baby that's coming close to the due date, um, there's no need for, for a woman to go to the hospital to have that baby. That's, that's a very um, normal, natural occurrence. And like other bodily processes and other things we do, there's, there's not a need for that person to go into the hospital to let that process occur. Um, if a woman wants to be medicated for her birth, you know, not everyone wants to consciously experience birth. And most women in our culture have a lot of body trauma, and there are plenty of valid and legitimate reasons for women to um, choose to be anesthetized for a birth. It's, it's the sensations are very intense, and not everybody feels that uh, that's something they want to experience. But if a woman wants an unmedicated birth, and she's healthy and low risk, I don't believe that process should happen in a hospital. And that is where wild birth can occur, is you know, if, of just letting it be a human occurrence rather than a medicalized experience. Which obviously human human beings have been doing for as long as human beings have existed. Exactly. It's uh, you know if birth didn't work as well as it does, um, we wouldn't have progressed to the point where we would even have hospitals, let alone you know taking over the entire planet. So um, walk me through a process of of so let's say that I were a woman. And let's say that I were pregnant. Um, what would walk me through the process from from that that would involve you or any other radical midwife from process of conception to process of whenever you're whenever you are are completed with this particular person? Sure. So ideally, women are thinking about what kind of birth they would want and what you know how they want to approach their birth process before they get pregnant. Not everyone's doing that. So if, if someone at the point of conception or the point at where she realizes she's pregnant um, understands that she wants to deliver at home, wants to have an undisrupted, you know, natural experience, 
she would, in most cases, find a midwife to help assist her. Um, and so where I live, there are multiple birth options. There are, you know, there are midwives in the hospital. There are midwives who do home birth. There are women who choose unassisted birth and learn about birth on their own and give birth you know, with either their friends or themselves at home or with their partner. So there are so many different options. But the kind of midwife that I was, the midwifery I practiced, is I had a license through the state, and women would come to me early in their pregnancy, and um, I would talk to them about what kind of care they wanted, what their hopes and plans were for, for delivery and for the pregnancy, um, what their needs are, and provide prenatal care for them on a pretty regular basis, seeing them monthly until later in the pregnancy, then every other week, and then every week as the due date came closer. Um, do some basic testing to make sure they're healthy and low risk. And then during the course of all that care, really work to um, educate and empower this woman to understand she's the primary player in this process. She's the authority in this process, the one authoring the story. And it's her. She's the one who has to get this baby out and doing all I can to help her get to that place of understanding that this is something she's going to do, not something that's going to happen to her. And then when it's time for that to happen, you know, my clients would call me usually in the middle of the night and I would join them and hold space while they go wild and have their babies. And I'm, I'm thinking, and, and what's the, what's the, what are the advantages of doing so? Cause, because I, I mean, the two advantages of, of medicalized birth that I can see are one of them is I was born breech and was a blue baby and had all sorts of problems. So, and you, you've sort of addressed that already with, with, you know, if there are problems and you already said head down. Um, mm -hmm. so if there are problems then then it helps to have another circumstance there. And then the other one is, um, everybody, it is a common, uh, I remember Carol Burnett, you know, decades ago, used to make jokes about how giving giving birth to a child was like having somebody, I don't remember what the joke was, but basically having somebody rip your lower lip over the top of your head or something. And so it's, it's talked about as an extremely painful process. So, so those seem to be two advantages of medicalizing would be A, if there's an emergency, and B, um, a choice of pain or not pain. Um, mm -hmm. So what? So what? What are the advantages the other way that counteract those, or or how are those wrong that I just said? Well, you know, birth is um, like all aspects of life. You know, healthy people don't just drop dead, and there are yellow flags before there are red flags before there's a medical emergency, and nearly all aspects of life. So, like your example, you know, breech baby, that's diagnosed well before labor, and that's a birth that um, many people would, would say should happen in the hospital. I, I believe it's always a woman's choice where a birth should occur. I don't think there should be laws about where a woman should be allowed to give birth. It would be my recommendation as a midwife that a breech birth should happen in the hospital. Um, but that's not something that you, you know about as the baby's coming out. It's, you know... At the very least, there are hours before the diagnosis of that to the delivery and time to get to the hospital. Um, midwives do carry basic emergency equipment. Most of the common emergencies that can happen at a birth um, can be handled at home just as well as in the hospital. A baby that might need some resuscitation, um, a hemorrhage, these things can be taken care of at home. You don't have the added infection risk that you have in the hospital where it's just, you know, hundreds of people coming through and lots of antibiotic resistant bacteria. There's always a greater infection risk in the hospital. Um, there's always a risk anytime we intervene. And this is where pain medicine is, is a real double-edged sword that when we anesthetize a woman, the birth becomes riskier for both her and for the baby. And a lot of women believe that, you know, they're willing to consciously experience this um, in order to, to um, give their child the gift of an unmedicated entry into this life. I and mean, there's unquestionably a difference between how well a baby's going to breastfeed, how well a baby's going to adapt during that first transitional hour of going from intrauterine life to extrauterine life. Um, a child with narcotics on board is going to have a harder time with those things. So there are advantages to the baby. Myself, I believe there are ecstatic and empowering aspects of birth that 
transcend the pain. You know, birth is a it is painful experience, but it's so much more than a painful experience. And I think so many rites of passage that we see for young men in in traditional in indigenous societies kind of like trying to get at something similar to birth to get the guys over that hump of, you know, into adulthood. And birth is a natural rite of passage that way for women. And you come out of it the other side understanding you're capable of much more than your mind thought you were capable of, um, that you're so much more solid than you thought you were, that you are, you know, an incredibly powerful being after you've experienced that consciously. So I, I would encourage people to reframe thinking about birth that way and not focusing so much on the pain as this is an experience worth bringing your conscious self to. Well, there's there's two directions I want to go with this. One of them is that um, can we talk for a minute about the larger um, the larger question of well, I'm going to go. I'm going to tell you the second thing I want to do first, and then talk about the first thing. The second thing is to uh, forget all that. <laughs> um, so there's, I think that there is a problem in this culture, and I say this as somebody with Crohn's disease who has had just about as severe pain as it's, and also avascular necrosis, both of which are some of the most painful conditions that there are. And mm -hmm. yes, it's nice to have pain relief, but at the same time, I recognize that this entire culture is based on numbing us out. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk for a moment about the and, and the second part of this is going to be, can you talk after that about not trying to guilt someone into accepting pain? So we're not saying that. But at the same time, can you talk about the larger social issue first of of how we attempt to avoid experiences that may cause pain, even though these may be the most transformative uh, experiences of our lives? Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Right, right. Um I do, and I think it's it's a very difficult topic that because it's hard to discuss this from like a broader, almost like a, a cultural anthropologist perspective without um, um, hurting the feelings of people in the individual position of being in pain. <laughs> so I do want to honor that. That, but I think that we are a pain avoiding society, and I think our attempts to avoid pain. And our attempts to, um, uh, you know, our attempts to avoid, like, we're, we have, like, this war on death as well, you know? Like, we, our, our fear of death and our attempts to avoid pain are actually making us all have more pain and be more at risk of all, you know, mass extinction dying than if we would just embrace the fact that life is not 100% comfortable and that mortality is part of who we are and what we are as a species. And pain is not necessarily always something to be avoided. Um, you know, marathon runners experience a lot of pain. That is incredible. I would much rather give birth again than run a marathon. I can't imagine surviving a marathon personally. But it's worth it to people taking on that experience. Um, chronic illness, that, you know, I don't want to compare that to birth because I really want to point out that birth is not a pathological experience. And the pain being experienced during birth is really the, the pain of incredible muscular stretching. So the, the cervix, the muscular bottom of the uterus, um, stretches from being essentially closed to, to being stretched wide enough for another person to pass through, you know, up to 10 pound or bigger baby to come through. And there's, um, there's a lot of intense sensation with that stretching. Um, many women who give birth who have, um, you know, I don't want to sound cliche, but who have done, you know, prenatal yoga classes before, worked with um, experiences like the uh, physically intense experiences like uh, sweat lodge or um, sitting in Vipassana meditation. People have worked with sitting with the intense physical sensations of the body often describe their birth as not painful, but just maximum physical intensity. Does that make sense of how it's different than an inflammatory process? Yeah, and I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking also of what you said earlier about many um, um, uh, rituals or rites of passage for many cultures can involve tremendous can, can involve extreme pain, and I'm thinking about 
you know, I, I'm sure you have too, that I've read a fair amount on trance states and how there are many ways to, p- human beings have, have developed many ways over their millennia of, of entering trance states. Um, there's, you know, the whirling dervishes, you know, there's spinning, there is, um, sex, there is all sorts of means, repetition, there is, um, and one of them is pain. And there are, mm-hmm. and, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out in terms of, of, of re-emphasizing what you said about there are many, many cultures where that has, where pain has been a part of a rite of transformation. In fact, I would say that there either emotional or physical pain is involved in every transformation because an old being dies and a new one is born. Right. Um, right. So even even a, a, a metaphorical transformation still involves great emotional discomfort. Um, right. And you know, and I believe there's an intelligence to life. I believe that that all life is well designed and intelligent. Without you know, I, I mean, I I really think that if birth were supposed to be different, it would be different. <laughs> I think that this is exactly the rite of passage a woman needs in order to transform into her new state of being, which is being this child's mother. And there, you know, we see it with other creatures. Like we acknowledge maternal fierceness in other creatures. It's people know that. Like you don't get between a mother bear and her cubs. You, you know, the the mother coyote with pups is the only one you need to fear whenever you're walking. Like this is something we acknowledge in in other species and ourselves as well. I think that unmedicated, undisturbed birth process transforms a woman into this you know, completely different person than she was before, where she is lit up and charged up in a way that she would do anything to protect her child, and she understands how strong she is, and she's not afraid of death, and she's not afraid of of extreme physical intensity, and I would like to see more women lit up that way in our culture, you know? I, I would like to see a return to maternal fierceness and i think our birth practices in the medical model are specifically designed to destroy that in women so can that that last sentence is especially intriguing can you go on about that for a moment sure if you look at so i described somewhat what it's like to have a home birth and what the midwifery experience of care is like if we contrast that with a woman who is planning a hospital birth so generally the woman um, gets finds out she's pregnant and does the traditional american route of prenatal care and birth she will go to a hospital provider usually an obstetrician the first thing that's done is um A dating ultrasound where even if the woman knows when she conceived, even if she is 100% sure about her last menstrual period or she's been trying to get pregnant and she knows exactly when her conception date was, that's not believed. It's actually medical dogma that women don't know when their last periods were. Women can't be believed. And she has to get a dating ultrasound. And so the pregnancy is not real until we see it on a television screen, essentially like a sonogram scene. Uh, And then we can quantifiably measure it with our scientific tools. Like that's when the pregnancy is deemed real and that's how the pregnancy is dated as this this is her due date now. And that's considered um, the absolute authoritarian assessment. Even if a woman knows she conceived three weeks earlier than what they're telling her, that will be ignored and that will be her due date. So that's the entry is an initial technocratic authoritarian assessment. And then the rest of her care is essentially a, um, you know, a series of surveillance episodes where she's, you know, they're looking for problems, they're looking for problems, they're looking for problems, where every time, you know, she's being screened for, does she have another disease? How about this? You know, uh, we have to test her for, for, um, for this infection and that infection. Things that are usually, if there are no symptoms, 99% of the time we know that's not happening, but the whole messaging of the care is your body's dangerous, you're not the authority in your life, and if we don't constantly um, you know, keep our eye on you, you're going to kill your baby. <laughs> and so that's the kind of care she's had before she enters labor, and about 60% of women in the United States end up being induced for labor. They don't start labor naturally. Um, if she does start na- labor naturally, she has to go then turn herself into these authorities who've already established this relationship with her that they know best um, about 
everything. It supersedes her own understanding of her reality. Uh, she goes to the hospital. Um, women are still restrained in labor in the United States. Um, People like to think that we've moved past that. Uh, people understand that in the 50s, women were strapped to the bed with leather restraints when they were laboring. That doesn't happen anymore, but now we have this, what's that old term, friendly fascism, where we have these pink and blue monitoring belts that go around her abdomen, and those are on a three-foot tether that hooks into a computer beside the bed. That's called constant fetal monitoring. And sometimes it's called fetal surveillance. <laughs> it's actually the medical term for it, is fetal surveillance. And so she's under constant surveillance during labor. She also has an IV further tethering her to the bed, so her movement is completely restrained. And you can imagine in a situation like that um, why the majority of women would then choose to be anesthetized. It's an incredibly uncomfortable situation to be coping with these extreme physical sensations that most people at some point consider pretty painful, not be able to move around, not be able to walk around, not be able to get into a position that feels right, to, but to be stuck in the bed. So most women do choose epidural anesthesia, which is um, a needle put into the space around the spinal column and anesthetic medication is put into the spinal column. So she's essentially, she is numb from the waist down, tethered to the bed. Um, getting continual um, vaginal exams to check cervical dilation, those are not optional. You know, she can't say no to having people put their fingers in her vagina during birth. And um, during this process, about 35% of the time, at some point, something looks wrong and a cesarean birth is, is the birth is kind of directed into a surgical situation, so 35% of babies in our culture are born surgically. If she does have a vaginal delivery, it's um, usually people are yelling at her to push. Often a uh, suction cup is put on the baby's head and the baby's pulled out with that. And it's, you know, as you can see, it's a very different experience <laughs> than, like, I had my son and, I, you know, I caught him myself in my bathtub, and it was the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. It's, uh, you know, juxtaposed a very, very different way of entering motherhood. And I think about the way we give birth, and I just think no other mammalian species would put up with that. <laughs> you know, like, even your house cat would rip your face off if you treated her that way in labor. But women are socialized to accept that kind of brutality. Um, well, let's talk about a um, the history of both the medicalization of birth and also the patriarchalization of birth um, going back. Is, isn't there a relationship between... Um, Mid midwives and the witch trials. Yes, and, you know I um, I've just read Sylvia Federici's book Caliban and the Witch, where she talks about the persecution of women when during the advent of capitalism in Europe and how after the Black Plague. Um, there was a labor shortage and people were leaving the feudal state and going back to living off the land and, you know, having, like, not needing to be in these um, hierarchical relationships with the landowners because there were so many fewer people. And the powers that be recognized that as a problem and really wanted to increase the population. And it was the women who knew how to prevent conception and end pregnancies who had to be eradicated in order to um, really boost up the the population of the you know the serf class the the oppressed people in Europe. So going after midwives has been happening for a very long time. Um, you know, women's bodies are the original means of production, right? <laughs> like this is something that has to be controlled in in patriarchy. The very core of patriarchy is the control of women's reproductive capacity. And I think that, you know, that is still going on in the way we, you know, the way that's still affecting the way we give birth now. Absolutely. It's, it's about the control of women's bodies. So before we talk more about that, um, can we can we go back to the um, the natural, the, the wild human birth versus the medicalized birth? And can you just say something that you said to me you wanted to talk about before we started the recording when you said you wanted to just absolutely emphasize that 
that while you think that that wild human birth is, as you say, integral to the struggle for the preservation of all wild systems on Earth, at the same time, you want to be absolutely sure you're not guilting people. You're not trying to control women as, as women are so often controlled. No, and I'm, I'm certainly not trying to judge women who, for whatever reasons, would choose to birth in the hospital, choose to have a medicated birth. I think that in this culture, you know, everything's presented as, well, that's that's her choice, that's her choice. And I'm very upset that that women have very limited and and bad choices and i think by the time a woman gets to the place of of making a decision about her birth her choices have already been completely restricted by this woman hating culture many places there aren't any home birth midwives many places women don't even know that there are options besides birthing with the particular birth attendants at the hospital in their town um, I'm not interested in guilt tripping or, or shaming or judging any woman for her particular birth experience or for her desires or wants within that experience. But I'm very interested in stepping back and looking at our cultural birth practices and how they are a rite of passage into a technocratic authoritarian culture. So I think you've done a really good job of setting that up. Can you, can you, can you, just hammer that point a little bit more about the introduction to the authoritarian technocratic culture. You, you, I don't know what else there is to say about it, but I'm hoping you do. I think um, you know, birth is the primary rite of passage, right? It's every human being's initial rite of passage or entry into the society. And every human culture has had some kind of ritual around that that's reflective of their values as a people, as a society. Um, our culture um, worships technology and science. We're very authoritarian. More and more there's this, um, this messaging of don't trust your your perception, your own understanding of material reality, like trust trust the outsiders, even if it makes no sense to you, it's like, you know, beaten into people that the authorities are always right. And I think the way we're doing birth is, is the, you know, perfect entry into that. There's, there's, once again, this was inflammatory and not having to do with, with giving birth, obviously, but a great example of that is I was having a terrible flare-up of Crohn's disease, and I went to a terrible doctor. And I've had most of my colon removed because because of Crohn's disease. And at one point, I said, it hurts right here. And I pointed to the lower right quadrant of my abdomen. And he looked at me and he said, it can't hurt there because your, your colon's gone. I was like, who am I supposed to believe, me who's actually having the pain or you who's telling me that I can't, I can't actually be feeling pain where I'm feeling pain? And it was just completely right. nuts. It is nuts. It is nuts. And it's nuts that we train our our medical providers to be people who say things like that and who believe things like that. Like, the, even the system of how we train our healers is insane, and we end up with insane healers who would tell a person that, that you, you know, your perception of reality cannot be true, and I know more about what it's like to live in your body than you do. <laughs> That's, it's crazy for someone, for a medical provider to say that, but it happens every day many, you know, countless times a day in our medical system, that kind of gaslighting is happening. So how was it? Can you go through the, the history a little bit more than you did already? Can you go through how was it? It's, it's completely counterintuitive that men would end up being in charge of the birthing process. That, 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 that seems like an incredible coup to me. It is an incredible coup, isn't it? Um, you know, and there are lots of great books people can read on this. One is uh, Jessica Mitford's The American Way of Birth. That's a great book on the history of how this happened in the United <coughs> States in particular. Um, so, um, you know, during colonial culture, it was primarily women attending the births of, of other women. Doctors were very rarely involved in the process. Um, there was a pretty strong tradition of midwifery. And then as, um, as for-profit medicine really took hold in the United States, there was this understanding among doctors that um, they weren't getting trained in birth, was part of it, because everyone was using midwives. Um, and that there was a need to get the um, 
what do they call it? Like the there's a line in the American Way of Birth where it's like the the um, the study material has to be brought to the young doctors, and the way to um, do that was the criminalization of midwifery because before antibiotics and blood transfusions, women unquestionably knew that the hospital was a very dangerous place for them to give birth. You know, really, um, this is before neonatal nurseries, um, before blood transfusions for hemorrhage, before anti-hemorrhage medications, before antibiotics. You know, the hospital, you were much more likely to die of an infection if you gave birth in the hospital than if you stayed at home with your midwife. You're much more likely to have a terrible outcome if you gave birth in the hospital. This is like the turn of the last century, the you know the late 1800s, early 1900s. And so women wouldn't voluntarily come into the hospital. So they targeted the midwi- midwives and made midwifery illegal um, all across the United States. It was a coordinated, targeted campaign by for-profit medicine. And very interestingly, the way they did that was not going after midwives as birth attendants because the population had loyalties to them as birth attendants for the reasons I just explained. What they did was criminalize abortion. And this is back when abortion was the primary method of birth control for people, and midwives were the abortion providers. Um, Midwives have always, throughout human history, helped women prevent and end pregnancies as much as they've helped women deliver babies. And the criminalization of abortion was a calculated ploy to get rid of midwives as birth attendants to bring this lucrative population into the hospital for birthing. So it's really fascinating history and how it, you know, people, even even in feminism, a lot of people don't make the connection between birth rights and abortion rights and how absolutely interconnected all of women's reproductive rights are. And what, what decades are we talking that that, that process really kicked into gear? From the, I think the 1870s through the 1920s, um, and it was really kind of wound down by you know by World War One. Uh, where I live in New Mexico, we entered. New Mexico didn't become a, a state in the United States until um, the 1910s. And this process had already happened everywhere else, and New Mexico was kind of like this forgotten place. So I live in one of the few states where midwifery has never been illegal. The rest of the country, midwifery has been criminalized, and it's it's only recently that um, that it has been decriminalized. Um, There's still 20, I believe, 23 states where home birth midwifery is illegal. And just before we move on with this, can you talk about a few of the... Um, means that were traditionally used for um, for abortion, and I'm thinking the reason I'm bringing this up is because I wondered for 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 years why people grow celery until I learned that it's an abortifacient. Um, ah. Yeah, I read that in some... Oh, that's a new one for me. <laughs> yeah, so, like, why the hell do people grow this? It's like you don't get any nutrients from it. And then, and then I read, was reading a book on, on witch trials, and that, mm-hmm. that uh, women who grew celery, this was a bad sign. Mm. Anyway, leave that aside. So what are some of the means <laughs> that they use through from, say, you know, 10,000 before current era up to up to the medicalization of, of abortion? How did they, how did they, what did, what did women do quite often? I think that um, there are many herbs all over the world that have been used as abortifacients. Um, one is cotton root, which the, the, um, the bark of the root of the cotton plant is a very effective abortifacient. And that was used by uh, women who were enslaved during the American slave era, the terrible, you know, these women who, you know, you would talk about not having any reproductive freedom. It was just horrific what was happening. And cotton root bark was an effective abortifacient. There are um, many documents of where slave slavers are upset that they're finding cotton root in the huts of, of the women that they've enslaved because people understood it was an abortifacient. What people were growing cotton so there was access to it. So that's one that we know is very effective and has this resistance history attached to it. Um, tansy, rue, um, various herbs. You know, I hadn't known about celery. There are herbs all over the world that people have used as abortifacients. And then women have always understood 
that, you know, that if you agitate the cervix, you can often provoke a miscarriage. I think there were lots of ways that people were doing that. You know, in, um, I don't know, about 10,000 years ago, but in the 1700s and 1800s, there were lots of menstrual regulation services where people could go and have a midwife insert a catheter into their uterus and, and with a little bit of suction, take out the menstrual fluid. Um, and this was, if you find old newspapers from the mid-1800s, there were many, many, many people advertising this service in New York, in Chicago, and in any place with a newspaper, you could find menstrual regulation services. Um, pregnancy was viewed differently before we have all this technology. Um, a pregnancy wasn't considered real until quickening, which is when a woman could feel the fetus moving. So people didn't have the same hang-ups about early abortion as we have now, and I think that it was just considered bringing on the menses. But it was early abortion that was happening, and it was very, very, very common. And medical doctors understood it was common. There, you know, and there were all sorts of eugenics ideas about who was accessing menstrual regulation services, and was it people that the powers that be wanted having more children, and those women's fertility would get, you know, controlled by instituting laws criminalizing those services. So there, there seems to be two threads in this in this interview, and one of the threads is. Um, the natural birth and the technology technologization of the birthing process, and that relates to the second thread, which is patriarchal assaults on the birthing process. And is there more that you want to say about um, about uh, patriarchal um, takeover of these? Uh, processes that are okay I'm going to use the word belong and I feel like I can use that t to you with you because I think you and I both know what we would both mean by the word belong but the processes that belong to women mm -hmm. um, recognizing that that you know childbirth belongs to the earth as much as women but in any case what's the I mean it's, it's a it's a larger natural process but but do you want to talk more about the patriarchal attempts to own these processes, processes to own women's reproductive capacities or reproductive processes. Um, do you want to talk more about that? Sure. Um, I'm trying to. You know, I think that the part of the issue is and there's a great Robin Morgan quote of um, "It's hard to fight an enemy that has outposts in your own head." And I think so much of the patriarchal control of women's bodies and, and reproduction in particular, um, that quote really sums up a lot of, of what is so difficult about women resting back, control getting back, women's health back into women's hands, is that we've all been so brainwashed to be so terrified of our bodies. And then we've also, most of us um, ourselves were born in a very... Um, highly technological, highly patriarchal way. So our, our own entry was that. We've got it in every cell of our body that this is the way birth happens. We don't have any living, large cultural examples of people just living a normal, natural life. It's very hard to liberate your own mind. Um, and then, then there's that bigger issue of even if you liberate your own mind, you live in this culture where you don't have good choices. Like we, we I know, you know, your work is some of, of the most powerful work out there on, to help people understand that individual choices can't change the system. The entire system has to be changed, and our individual consumer birth choices can't change the giant birthing culture. It has to be a revolutionary movement that does that. Um, and that's, that's the piece that's really, I'm just sitting with a lot of just everything is breaking down so much. Everyone is becoming so much more, um, like almost like cyborg. Do you know what I'm saying by that, Derek? Like we're just kind of merging with technology and it's harder and harder to resist that. And what's happening with birth is, is um, a microcosm of that, but it's also the entry into that. Yeah, I, I do understand, I believe, what you're talking about. And, and I'm thinking also of, I think that there are, there are cogent arguments to be made that the patriarchal death urge 
in some ways emerges from the understanding that women give birth. And mm. there is, there's a line that Richard Drennan said to me decades ago now that really stuck with me, which was, if a woman can, can create life, if a woman can, can, can give birth and I can control or kill this woman, who is the most powerful? And right. for me, at least, that is the central patriarchal, part of the central patriarchal pathology is this, uh, the opposite of what, of what Freud talked about. It's, it's womb envy. And yeah. this is one reason that scientists get so damn excited when they're able to combine enzymes in a lab. And it's like, oh, my God, we're creating life. When it's like, hello, let's look at a female rabbit, you know? Right. And, right. and they get so excited. We're going to find life on Mars as they kill life here. And so mm -hmm. it seems to me that there is, I mean, for, for me at least, this envy, jealousy, hatred of women and attempt to control women's reproductive processes, for me at least, goes to the very, very, very core of the patriarchal death impulse. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think that, you know, we've progressed so much further. Now Now we've got scientists seriously talking about artificial wombs and as, as though they can replicate, like, the intricate, constantly changing um, biochemical environment of a living woman. You know, like that. There's no way they can make an artificial womb that would produce a, a person that's a normal person, but they're so excited about that. But... The way, you know, birth has been controlled, especially since the advent of industrialization, um, is very much about men controlling birth and this, you know, about the woman doesn't view herself as giving birth. It's, um, you know, the, the doctor delivered the baby. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a way of, of claiming ownership of the process. Absolutely. One thing I really notice all the time when I'm talking to people who've birthed at home versus people who've birthed in the hospital, when women give birth at home, they talk about their birth as their entry into parenthood, their entry into motherhood. When families give birth in the hospital, universally I hear when we brought you home from the hospital is their entry. So it's like the the hospital kind of owns the baby up to that point or something. Like, they have taken total um, credit for the experience, and it's not even your baby until you leave. Go ahead. No, I, I was done. So we have about um, five or six minutes left, and um, do you want to talk, and if you don't want to talk about this, this is fine. Do you want to talk about the recent movement to... Um, to talk about uh, birthing not as a women's process, but to talk about pregnant people, or do we not have enough time for that? Well, you know, there's never enough time. It's such a rabbit hole, but we can talk about that for five minutes. Um, or let's talk about it for four minutes and then wind down for one minute. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so there, I was involved in a big controversy last year where the Midwives Alliance of North America um, uh, gave in to pressure from the queer activist community to change their language to erase the words woman and mother from the core competency documents of the organization and, and to put in birthing parent and pregnant individual. Um, and this is happening everywhere in um, in. The, everything that has to do with women, all of women's culture is kind of being hijacked right now by this postmodern uh, queer theory movement of, of um, you know, there's no such thing as a woman. There is, no, there is no material reality. Woman is what anybody says a woman is. And I think this, you know, I just, I've I obviously have done a ton of thinking about this and why is it so deeply upsetting to me. Um, and I do think that if we look at larger cultural forces, there's this enormous, well-funded, transhumanist movement trying to completely untether humanity from our connection to the earth, from our understanding of ourselves as a living organism among other living organisms on the living system that is this planet. Um, and this, this movement is very frightening to me. And I think that transgenderism falls under that umbrella of trying to completely divorce ourselves from 
being living creatures with you know a wild side to ourselves or and you know we we are here among other creatures and and we're not superior to other creatures we're not different from them and the ways we're different are the ways we shouldn't be cultivating ourselves and it it is to me a very dangerous movement to to separate our understanding of birth from understanding that women give birth is that that doesn't quite get at it it's such a huge issue even the new york times which has been grammatically stodgy talks about um, males transitioning to females. And mm. grammatically, that's, that, that disturbs me very deeply, and disturbs me very deeply on many levels, but including grammatically, because um, every single human being on the planet and every single human being who has ever been on the planet was born because a male sperm and a female egg met and was carried by a female. And you can't erase millions of years of biology to no. to uh, to um, it, it, for me at least this goes to the core of what I perceive as the problem with the murder of the planet which is the belief that what we believe is more important than what is right right and I think that that what you're talking about that patriarchal death urge that worshiping those who give death versus revering those who give life, um, this is a, a, you know, it is an acceleration of that. You know, we all carry our mitochondrial female lineage um, in our bodies. We, we can all trace back an uninterrupted female lineage in our species, and that's, to me, important to acknowledge. It's, um, and it is something that is female power um not power over but power from within and then yes the the dominant culture wants us all to be completely untethered from the material reality so we don't notice the birds disappearing the oceans dying off we don't notice our own anxiety around the murder of the planet and that we just parrot back what we're being told is reality that we all know is not reality it's so interesting that I watched medical providers tie themselves into rhetorical knots of there's no such thing as biological sex, and yet I have yet to hear of a problem of uh, medical providers putting IUDs in penises. You know, I think this is like they still understand which bodies reproduce. It's a completely rhetorical. Um, math and sanity tactic and and it's uh, i believe it's about becoming completely untethered it is about the murder of the planet it is about about whether or not we're gonna survive and and whether or not we're gonna be able to prevent everything else from being destroyed with us when we talk about um getting rid of the word mother and talking about you can't say pregnant female it's it it, some parts of me almost feel like the postmodernists are seeing how far they can push us before all of a sudden they stop and start laughing and say, ha, burned you. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's like we got you to fool. We fooled you this far. I mean, to actually get an entire culture and to get midwives to not be able right. to say the words mother or pregnant female. It, it I, 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 I it, it, it leaves Mr. Guy, who has written millions of words, speechless. Right. Right. And it's a very authoritarian, totalitarian technique. It, it just it reminds me of um, what happened in Cambodia, where Pol Pot declared it was year zero, and anyone who was talking about the past would be killed because that time period had not existed. This is a... Um, it's very frightening to me to enforce a false perception onto a culture. And I don't know what their end game is, but I, it's very frightening to me. And I don't think that it's good for women. I don't think it's good for the earth for us to become untethered from material reality. Well, and I'm going to make a really stupid joke here, but it's also not good for, for stoners because everybody <laughs> knows that you smoke the female marijuana plant, not the male marijuana plant. Oops. <laughs> so, so what is it? We smoke the THB, THC bearing plant? Is that what we say now? <laughs> Well, even that doesn't quite get at it. Well, you don't know how those plants identify, so <laughs> it's, um, it's not good for anyone. And people, you know, if people want to keep having eggs, like you're not going to be able to, to eat chicken eggs if you fill your coop with roosters. Like it's just, it makes no sense 
that people are are falling for this when everybody can somehow figure out what sex their dog is like it just doesn't make any sense i think that's one of the reasons why it's so deeply upsetting is it's it's completely ridiculous it doesn't have any material um truth to it and and people know that if two males are having sex or two females are having sex uh, of humans they have they know that they don't actually have to worry about pregnancy right you're not going to end up with a quote pregnant person end quote right exactly um but it's the same you know i was raising chickens and i wanted to have babies i didn't want for them to have babies and so i got a rooster i mean everybody knows Mm -hmm. that Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it's um, and you don't need like an authority figure to come assign sex to your puppies. You know, whenever your dog has puppies, like everyone can tell which are which dogs are male and which are female. My my dog, who is she is neutered. She and I mean, she's been spayed, but she can tell which dogs are male and which are female. Like we are living organisms. We can discern. You know, we have an intelligence test that is deeper than our thought process. And I really think that all of what we've been talking about is just this further and further um, destruction of our living wisdom of our bodies. And I think if there's any hope for us, it's about getting back in touch with the living wisdom of the body. Well, thank you so much. And that would be a great note to end on. But is there anything else you want to say in like 30 seconds to 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 sort of bring everything home about birth and everything we've been talking about? No, I think I think we covered most of it. I think we should leave it on that. I just would really encourage everyone to live in their body and listen to their body and trust themselves more than they trust authority figures. That's a good note to end on. So I would like to thank you for, for the interview, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Mary Lou Singleton. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.